Hey guys, it's MJ, the student tech tree, and I've been getting a lot of requests to continue the CA1 videos. So we're going to be talking about the valuation of individual investments. This is chapter 23. And like CA1, um, all the previous CA1 um, videos, I'm looking at the actual notes that I used when I studied for the subject back in 2013. And what we're going to do is just we're going to talk about it. I'm going to show you my notes. Uh, feel free to use the acronyms that I've learned um, to remember the stuff. And yeah, feel free to ask any questions in the comment section below. So with that little intro done, let's get into this uh, subject. So what's happening here? Oh, there we go. Okay, the introduction. So in this video, I'm going to look at the aims and objectives of valuing assets, the various reasons and the types of assets we do. Um, and I'm going to be asking the question, why are there different methods of valuation? And you can see I've got a picture of the Mona Lisa with the whole idea of how do you value something that is priceless? I mean, the mere fact that it's priceless suggests that it doesn't have a value or that its value is extremely high. Um, but again, here we're coming to it. Why do we value assets? Um, and there's four, four main reasons. The first is to, to ask yourself, let's say you're a buyer um, and someone gives you, uh, offers you an item. You need to ask yourself, is this expensive or is this cheap? If it's cheap, you're going to be more likely to purchase it than if it, you find it expensive. Um, let's say you have an item and somebody comes up to you and says, uh, they'd like to purchase it for a specific amount. Um, if you value that item as being larger than that amount, then you're going to want to hold on to the asset. If it is um, less than the value that they're offering, you might look at selling it. Um, for most of your day job, office work, Valuation is very important when it comes to reporting, whether it be for accounting purposes, regulations, um, or just strategic uh, decision making. So reporting is uh, a big one. And I guess coming back to the regulation and seeing um, is my company doing well overall, we want to see what's the total value of my assets, what's the total value of my liabilities, and hopefully the assets will be greater than the liabilities because that's good for a company. However, that does in, uh, introduce a little bit of a bias in the fact that we're not going into this very objectively. We do want the assets to be valued higher than the liabilities. And because valuation is a little bit of an art as well as a science, there might be a bias towards overvaluing assets and undervaluing liabilities. So that's something you need to consider. Okay. Um, the whole thing here is that well, what this slide is showing is that there is various ways to, to determine the value of an asset. Um, the, the supervisory notes that the actuarial societies make uh, may be a little bit in conflict with how management or how your company uh, does it. So the best way to do it is just to be consistent between your valuations of assets and liabilities. One way you can crypt the books in accounting is to change your valuation method from one year to the other and that would introduce a loss or a gain which you can use to manipulate tax or dividends or um, you know investment performance and all that type of stuff. So you'll find with accounting you normally have to disclose, I think you have to disclose if you change the valuation but you don't really want to do that because then it's very difficult to compare last year with the previous year, sorry, last, uh, last year with this year and stuff like that. So big thing to uh, realize is that you want to keep your valuation methods consistent. Okay, there's two various ways to do it. Um, the top down or the bottom up. Top down is more of a passive approach. This is where you put emphasis on the asset class and the sector allocation. So you can be like, oh, the mining industry is not doing so good. Um, now let's work down to the individual shares. Or you can take a more active approach where you focus on the individual investments um, and say, oh, Anglo-America, let's look at their staff, let's look at their management team, okay, let's look at their assets, and you slowly build your way up. So these are two different approaches that you can take on, um, and you can see various different asset managers will have different strategies in this realm. Um, so yeah, this is the top down. You look at the asset class, you then look at the sector, and then you look at the individual investment. Remember, this this um, is the actuarial control cycle. 
Um, I got this from a UCT slide, so thank you to them. Um, and this is just showing you where this chapter fits in the big scheme of things. Remember, CA1 is a massive subject. It is huge. And it's important to remember that all the chapters are interlocking. So this is an important chapter as it is uh, part of the actuarial control cycle. Okay, so how do we value an asset? Uh, again, a UCT slide, and this is the seven steps. First, you want to determine the purpose of the valuation. Um, am I doing it for regulation? Because then they might have a prescribed method. Am I doing it for reporting? Because then I might do it a different method. So your purpose will influence your, your method. The method you then choose will also influence the data you need to obtain, um, the model you, that you need to build, you then set your assumptions, you calculate the value, and then you must always assess the validity of that value. Does this make sense? Is it what we expected? You know, those are good questions to ask yourself when doing this. Okay, when it comes to methods, um, you might be wondering why I have that little troll thing over there. Um, back in the day, that was something known as a fad. So, and the way I re remember the, the various types of methods is the acronym SHAM FADS. I know, don't, don't judge me. Uh, but the various ways are smoothing, historic cost, adjusted cost, market value, fair value, arbitrage, discounted cash flow, and stochastic. You need to know these methods backwards, okay, backwards. And in certain questions, you might have to talk about each of them, each of the, how many are there? Are there eight? Well, there's eight of these things. You might have to mention a few points on, on each one. Um, so yeah, this is just a, a little picture uh, that just explains them a little bit more uh, with regards to book value or smooth market value, just kind of cash flow, stochastic model, arbitrage value. Um, I don't know if, if, if I should get into each one. I mean, book value, it's, okay, I bought this asset at 100 bucks. Um, it's depreciated by 10, so the value is 90. Um, the smooth market value is saying, I bought it at 100, I could replace it um, for 98, and then the following year you find out, oh, you could replace it for 110, and you try to smooth it so that, let's say you want to sell it halfway in the year, what that price should be. Uh, discounted cash flow, let's say you want to purchase a share and it's got a stream of dividends. One way to do it is to take all those dividend streams, uh, take the present value, bring them back to time zero, and say, okay, this is the value of the share. It sounds great in theory, but what do you assign the risk rate to be? And how do you assign the probabilities of actually getting those expected cash flows? And is there a growth assumption that you're taking into consideration? So there's a lot to be said about this kind of cash flow. There's also stochastic models um, where you introduce random variables and you use cool fancy computers. That's pretty cool. And then there's also arbitrage value, which um, is also it's quite a complicated thing. Um, but it's in subject CT8, uh, so just re remember that type of stuff. Because yeah, you should only really be doing subject CA1 if you've passed all the other, or at least attempted all of the other CT exams. Um, otherwise, yeah, you're very brave to go come into the subject without completing those previous ones. Okay, um, again, this is just more stuff talking about the methods. Uh, feel free to pause, copy this table. Um, I just gave some certain circumstances when you would want to use uh, the methods um, and again some associations and stuff like that. Because remember, that's the thing, they've got different names. That's what makes it so much fun. So it could be called the historic method or it could be called the book value method. It could be the adjusted method or it could be the written up, written down method. It could be the market value, it could be the volatile uh, or understood value. So you need to know that these things have various names and it does get tricky. Don't treat this chapter lightly. Um, then, yeah, some of the things I just made were very important with regards to each method is how well is it understood? Is it objective? Is it subjective? Is it consistent? Are the accountants happy with it? Is it conservative? Is there more than uh, one way of doing it? What's the time it takes to do this method? How volatile is it? And how much does it cost? These are things that you want to think about on each of the various methods. Okay, fair value. Fair value is an important method. Um, it's one the accountants get really excited about. And it is the amount for which an asset could be exchanged or a liabil liability settled between knowledgeable, willing parties at arm's length. You need to learn that definition so well that you dream about it. Because most papers, 
you either need to know this directly or indirectly but fair value you can see it it kind of makes this uh, statement but there's a lot of subjectivity around it because uh, what is knowledgeable what is willing parties um, and stuff like that but it's something that you need to know that definition of the heart hence why it's got its own little slide all by itself talking more about fair value um, normally you could take the market value as an indicative price uh, maybe combined with the stochastic asset model or say what is the most recent known price and adjust it in line with some sort of index okay bonds um, oh yeah then like the rest of this um, video is going to be about how do you value the various um, asset classes bonds I mean you can get away with the discounted cash flow um, but don't forget the redemption amounts and also one thing that could make bonds a little bit tricky is if there are options built into them. Remember you do need to adjust the interest rate that you do use for market risk and security risk and that's a subjective thing. That, that's why, like I said, the discount cash flow sounds great in theory but what are you going to make this I? It takes experience and yeah, so just be careful about that using discounted cash flow. Um, equity valuation, again, is something that uses the discounted cash flow, but I don't think people really do this in practice um, because there is this growth factor, but what is that growth factor? And so that's the thing is these methods are not perfect, hence why there's so many of them uh, because they all have their drawbacks which you need to be very familiar with. Um, assumptions with the when you're valuing equities is you normally make these assumptions that uh, the dividends are received annually, the, the growth is constant, and that it is independent, okay, and that shares are held in perpetuity. Okay, but as we're going to see, dividends are payable annually with the next pa uh, payment in one year's time. That's just an assumption. It could be every six months, and that makes the math a little bit um, more ugly, not as simple. Um, we're also assuming dividends grow at a constant rate, we know historically and empirically that very rarely happens, hence a breakdown of this uh, model. And the required rate of return is independent of the times at which payments are received. That's a little bit of a more interesting assumption to think about, um, and it could very well be an exam question. Although, I don't know, I don't set these exams. Uh, well, not yet. Uh, <laughs> issues of the simplified model. Like I said, the value of the growth, the value of the interest rate, the sensitivity to the difference between interest rate and growth, dividend frequency, and taxes ignored. Where if you have seen my CT2 video, which is actually, watch those videos. If you're studying CA1, it's very good to watch the CT2 videos I'm making just as like a re refresher course. And because you'll see tax is a big component in the financial industry. I hate it, but, and this model clearly doesn't like it because it's been ignored but it is something that will distort your figures if you don't consider it. Okay, when deciding what value you want to use, uh, you always need to think, what are my liabilities? What is my required rate of return? What is my required risk premium? How am I going to be taxed? Um, okay, so this is when you're deciding what assets to, to buy. Um, you want something that matches your liabilities, that meets your required rate of return, and that um, you've got a required risk appetite, and that you're not getting a tax disadvantage because various assets have different tax uh, laws. It gets very confusing. Um, there are some other methods. I mean, there's market value, there's the net asset value, there's the measurable key factors, there's the economic value added. Um, but those are, you need to know them, but th it's not that likely that they'll ask you a question, but best to know them. Um, I mean, economic value added, you look at the operating profit over one year, you less the cost of capital, supporting those results, and that's the, the amount of value you've added economically. Um, I mean, there's other things you can do is you can measure measurable key factors. This is more an accounting thing. You know, what's the efficiency of turnover, the turnover per square of per staff, um, various ratios, credit turnover, delay payments, market share, management quality. And this is almost what people use or analysts use to measure uh, the value of a stock. Um, the whole school of, school of thinking is that this is a superior way to the discounted cash flow and they can then pick up if there's a difference or inconsistency between the valuations, buy the stocks that are undervalued, short the stocks that are overvalued with the hope that the market is a little bit efficient and it will converge to the true price. 
Um, property valuation, I mean, there's a lot to be said about property valuation. I've got a little thing there. I mean, you need to take in rent and expenses and probability that the tenant stops paying, that you don't have a tenant for a while. Um, it gets a lot of fun. I mean, property factors for, for the interest, you need to consider these additional risks, like I said, default, void, volatility of returns, and the marketability of your property. Each property is going to be a little bit different. Uh, one way to remember it is Wall Street. Um, Wall Street is the, the prime, I remember I've spoken about this in a previous video on asset classes, so go check that out. Uh, but also things to consider when thinking about the value of a property, what is its use, what are the prospects for rental growth, what are the alternative uses, I mean is it just going to be a factory its whole life or will it maybe change into fancy lofts where artists will come and the value will skyrocket, this has happened in New York's waterfront and also happening in Cape Town's waterfront and probably other countries um, around the world. Um, any development potential, like I said, um, if you had bought in the waterfront, these areas tend to grow in value, you want to consider that in your valuation and also some economic factors. Is there an oversupply? How's the local economy doing? I mean, there is so much to be said for CA1. So you guys need to be prepared so well in the theory. So when you go into this exam, you can just apply the information and score lots of marks. Um, the calculations, oh, I don't want to get into that now. Um, options, options tend to take the no arbitrage um, uh, valuation method. This is something that you should be very familiar with from subject CT8. And I think subject CT2 also mentions a little bit of that. So I will be making a video on the no arbitrage. Also, no, wait, that's subject CT1, which I do have a video on the no arbitrage. So go check that out to refresh yourself. Um, swaps are basically just a little bit uh, similar, uh, just a little bit more complicated. Um, swaps can be valued by discounting the two component cash flows. At inception, the value of the swap to both parties will be zero. When interest rate changes, so does the payment, and that's the big trick. Okay, and that's basically the end of this chapter. Sure, it was quite crazy. I know I spoke quite quite quickly. Watch the video again. Um, YouTube does have that little feature where you can slow my voice down. Um, and like I said, you can always pause the video at various times. But don't take this chapter lightly. It is tricky. It is harder than it seems. And you need to put your thinking cap on when you tackle these questions. But do lots of past papers and you will be fine. And prepare a lot. Prepare, prepare, prepare. But that's all I've got time for. I'm going to try and make a few more of the CA1 videos because I know you guys want them. So hopefully I can get them up as soon as possible. Thank you so much. And yeah, tell all your friends because then they can also watch the video. They can comment and you guys can have little discussions in the comment section below. Cheers.